Um, our final speaker for the day uh, is Professor Roger Scruton. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't need any introduction. He's a visiting professor at the faculty here, uh, dearly loved uh, uh, fellow of Blackfriars Hall. Uh, he's also uh, uh, got a position at St. Andrews and another one in the States and has written more books than many people have read. Uh, so without further ado, <laughs> if you'd like to welcome Roger Scruton. Just about um, everything that can be said about this topic has been said already, uh, and um, what I will talk about is something slightly ancillary to the ontological and uh, metaphysical questions that have been in the air during the course of this afternoon. Uh, I entitled this The Person and the Parson, but uh, that's not quite the right uh, description. I want to say something about the place of the concept of the person not just in the moral life, but in the, in the evolution of modern societies, uh, and just what it means for us today in, in, the, uh, in an era in which religious education has essentially been eclipsed by uh, secular forms of education. <coughs> uh, and as I say, m much of what I've, set, uh, I've prepared has already been said. So the term persona comes to us from Roman, the Roman and Etruscan theatre, where it denoted the mask worn by the actor, and therefore the character whom the actor portrayed. Uh, and the term was borrowed by the, <coughs> the Roman law, uh, as we've already heard, to describe any entity that has judiciable rights and duties. And that includes corporate entities and other more abstract constructions, as uh, Jonathan Price pointed out to us, which means that the, the concept is already stretching across all kinds of uh, metaphysical categories. The primary examples of legal persons, however, on which all others depend, were, for Roman law, as for our law, adult human beings, whose legal personality is the direct consequence of their ability to make free and accountable choices. The term was borrowed again by early Christian theologians, as we have also heard, in order to explain the doctrine of the Trinity by distinguishing the three persons of God. Discussions of the Trinity led to the view that personhood belongs to the essence of whatever possesses it. And the 6th century philosopher Boethius took this as his cue in defining the essential nature of the human being. For Boethius, the human person is a, an individual substance of a rational nature. And that definition was adopted by Aquinas, as we've just heard, and remained in place until the Enlightenment, when two great philosophers, Locke and Kant, saw fit to re-examine the whole idea and untangle its philosophical complexities. For Locke, person is a forensic term, as he put it, one that is used to appropriate actions and their merit, or as we might rather say, to impute actions and responsibilities to an individual as in a court of law. Uh, and I think that underlies Peter Hacker's description of the, uh, of, of the concept of person as a status concept this morning. For Kant, uh, as for Boethius and Aquinas, the concept contains the secret of the human condition, but it's a different secret. In Kant's view, however, it is not the idea of individual substance, but that of our rational nature that is the crux. Persons are distinguished from all other objects by their reason, and therefore by the transcendental freedom upon which the exercise of reason depends. As a consequence of this freedom, the human person is subject to the categorical imperative which obliges him to treat every person, himself included, as an end in himself. Locke raised the unsolved, and in my view, unsolvable question of personal identity. Kant initiated the philosophical tradition that runs through Schiller, Schelling, Fichte and Hegel, which sees the subject, the self-conscious I, as the heart of the moral order. This tradition has gone through many subsequent reforms and amendments to enter modern debates in the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre, personalism of Max Scheler and Karl Wojtyla, and the discussions of freedom and justice in analytical philosophy, which I'll touch on later. So looking back across that historical landscape, we see the evolution of the concept of the person as part of the self-understanding of Western civilization, and a crucial factor in the emergence of the modern world. The concept began in the theatre, passed to the law, was picked up by theology and then by philosophy, and finally embedded in the social and political norms of the modern world. Almost everyone makes use of the concept 
when endeavouring to describe what is distinctive of the human condition and the constraints on how human beings should be treated. When we refer to human rights, human dignity, what we owe to each other, and such fundamental values as freedom, justice, and the rule of law, we are making use, directly or indirectly, of the concept of the person, which provides the shared perspective from which we address virtually all such issues. Human communities are communities of persons, and it is the point of agreement from which our disagreements begin. I say this as a point of agreement, but Peter Hacker would say that in adopting the unnatural plural persons, I have already attempted to impose a strained conception on our ordinary ways of thinking. So I'll bear that in mind. Precisely because it is so widely accepted as foundational, however, the idea of the person has been detached from the history that gave rise to it and presented in purely abstract terms as a rational construct that is not dependent on any specific experience of community. This movement towards abstraction is vividly apparent in the writings of Kant, and it was one of the aspects of the Kantian philosophy that subsequent idealists, Hegel especially, strove to overcome. But I don't think that Hegel's lesson has been learned, and we find ourselves today with a deeply conflicted idea of the person, upon which we nevertheless rely as the premise of our collective decision-making. The conflicts are immediately apparent in the sphere of human rights, for libertarians, human rights are freedoms which must be protected by the state in order to safeguard the sovereignty of the individual. For socialists, human rights are claims which must be satisfied by the state in order to offer a viable and dignified life to all its citizens. Uh, this distinction between freedom rights and claim rights is familiar for in jurisprudence uh, to, since the work of Hofeld, but I won't go into it as clear to you, I hope. Libertarians defend individual freedom against the state, therefore. Socialists defend the state against individual freedom. We see this vividly in the current disputes over education and health care, with libertarians arguing for choice and socialists arguing for equal provision, something that only the state can attempt and only by removing choices from the active, the ambitious and the strong. In other words, people like me. <laughs> if we look again at the history of the person idea, we see that this conflict was all but inevitable. As it evolved, the concept of the person became caught up in the unceasing intellectual dispute between individualists and communitarians. The concept was required to embrace both individual sovereignty and political community. People know in their hearts that they are pulled in both directions and they value individual liberty as the sine qua known of consensual government, and also that they value community as the soil in which liberty grows. Rousseau's fantasy that we are born free has no weight for us today, now that we have seen what results from the attempt to put it into practice. And the knowledge that we become free reminds us of all the other aspects of human communities that must be in place if real individual freedom is to emerge in them. For those and related reasons, getting clear about the concept of the person is, for our generation, an intellectual priority. Countless secular philosophies lean upon the idea. Those who build a universal political doctrine on the foundation of human rights are in need of a theory that tells them which rights belong to our nature and which are the product of convention. That theory, I believe, will be a theory of the person, not a theory of the human being. Marxists who found their critique of bourgeois society on the idea of exploitation and the dignity of labour rely on the view that there is a fulfilled and free relation between people that the capitalist system suppresses. That view demands a theory of the person. Theists see the goal of human life as the knowledge and love of a personal God whose presence is revealed in the natural order. We can make sense of that view only if we have a theory of the person. Left liberals see political order as a mechanism for reconciling individual freedom with social justice. That idea, too, depends on a theory of the person. The allegedly Kantian philosophy of the person, assumed by John Rawls in his defence of the redistributive state, is used by Robert Nozick to attack it. In every area of political conflict today, we find the concept of the person at the centre of the dispute, but treated as a mere abstraction with little or no attention to its social and historical context. 
we see this problem, the sort of the problem emerging or surfacing in the difficult social issues of our time. If the defining feature of the human person is the freedom to make autonomous choices, then libertarians would argue that governments and civil associations have no right to interfere with our individual choices, save on the ground proposed by Mill of protecting others from harm. In other words, allowing others to make choices also. We move quickly from that position to a defense of pornography as free speech, as, in, as has happened through the um, United States Supreme Court. The defense also of no fault divorce as a contractual right, of gay marriage as a lifestyle choice, of teenage promiscuity as a practice run for later commitments and later ways of, avo of avoiding them. If the defining feature of the human person is rather the life in a community of mutual aid, then communitarians will argue that we must constrain antisocial lifestyles and provide for a compassionate society in which caring is an institutional fact. We then move quickly to a defense of redistribution, of ideological vetting of textbooks, of laws forbidding hate speech and free association, of a moratorium on prayers in the classroom and Christmas festivities in the public square. Usually there is very little consistent consistency here. In my experience, the same person will use libertarian arguments to justify pornography and promiscuous sex, and communitarian arguments to justify redistributive taxation, hate speech laws, and the expulsion of Christianity from the public square. All those policies satisfy a need to repudiate the social order understood as ours, the old order of the settled Christian community, in which marriage, children, church, and security were the primary social goals and all of life enjoyed the vague but inclusive blessing of the resident parson. It is as though the concept of the person has turned against the civilization that gave rise to it, flashing its chameleon tongue at all our cherished customs, but with what authority we do not really know. The conflicting accounts of the person to which I have just alluded arise because people have taken the concept out of context, seeking to define it in abstract terms and without reference to the way in which personhood is a way of becoming and not just a way of being. Libertarians emphasize freedom but give us no real account of the origins of freedom or its metaphysical basis. Communitarians emphasize social dependence but fail to explore the difference between the groupings of animals and those of free beings whose associations are founded in contract and consent and whose social fulfillment comes only in the mutual recognition of their individual autonomy. What we should recognize, I believe, is the origin of personality in the I to you encounter. The point has been made poetically by Martin Buber in his celebrated book, Ich und Du, and analytically by Stephen Darwell in The Second Person Standpoint. But we owe the underlying insight to Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Personal relations are a calling to account. I give reasons to you and ask for reasons in return. I explain myself through describing what the world means in my perspective. I am answerable to you for what I say and do, and you likewise to me. It is not that these features of our condition flow from our transcendental freedom, as Kant would put it. They are what freedom consists in. Giving each other reasons, holding each other to account, praising, blaming, and negotiating, working for the other's acceptance, and being in turn influenced to, to, to accept, these are all moments in an ongoing dialogue in which each of us aims his attention not to the body of the other, but to the first person perspective that shines in his face and breathes in his words. To put it in Hegel's way, we are subjects for each other, not objects. And the subject-to-subject -subject encounter is one of mutual <coughs> recognition in which each acknowledges the other's autonomy and also holds the other responsible for what he is and does and feels. My freedom is not an uncaused eruption into the world of human events. It is a product of my social condition and brings with it the full burden of accountability to the other and the recognition that his voice has just as much authority as mine. If this is so, then we should conclude that the libertarian and the communitarian are both equally one-sided. Freedom and accountability are coextensive in the human agent. And the I to you dialogue through which we address each other 
involves a search for reasons that have weight for you as much as for me. There is at the heart of the human community the common pursuit of reasons that will be valid for all of us. Next time you have a quarrel with someone, you can test this out. You will find that you seek to justify yourself with reasons that the other will accept, whose validity does not depend on the particular desires that distinguish you, but on matters which lie rooted in your shared human nature and shared social circumstances. Freedom and community are linked by their very nature, and the truly free being is always taking account of others in order to coordinate his presence with theirs. That kind of freedom is never more clearly conveyed than by dancers, when they consciously lift their bodies above the world of cause and effect and place them in a realm where every movement has a shared reason and a shared meaning and not just a physical cause. I don't say that every dance is like that, but in its highest form, dancing creates a community of persons whose movements are movements of the I, the ich, movements with a reason, where my reason is you. Schiller noticed this and gave the following somewhat Kantian description of what we now know as Scottish country dancing, but which he described as English. This is a quotation from Callias concerning beauty, letters to Gottfried Keller. The first law of gentility is have consideration for the freedom of others. The second, show your freedom. The correct fulfillment of both is an infinitely difficult problem. But gentility always requires it relentlessly, and it alone makes the cosmopolitan person. I know of no more fitting image for the ideal of beautiful relations than the well-danced and multiply convoluted English dance. The spectator in the gallery, see where he's coming from, sees countless movements which cross each other colourfully and change their direction willfully, but never collide. Everything has been arranged so that the first has already made room for the second before he arrives. Everything comes together so skillfully and yet so artlessly that both seem merely to be following their own mind while never impeding the other. This is the most fitting picture of a maintained personal freedom which respects the freedom of others. The important point here is that individual freedom and social coordination come into being together, and the sight of their coincidence is the most persuasive confirmation available to us that they are deep down one and the same. If you are not persuaded by Schiller's example, then a glance at the YouTube records of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers or the miraculous Nicholas Brothers will surely convince you of this. It is not that we begin life as animals and then become persons. It is rather that personhood, which is an essential part of the human condition, is also a form of becoming. It is a potential wrapped within us from the outset, which gradually unfolds through the encounter with others as we respond to them eye to eye, each taking responsibility for his actions, emotions and desires. We should see the life of the person as rooted in the community of others, growing into autonomy and independence, flowering in the moments of love and commitment and bearing fruit in due course in the next generation. But this means that things can go wrong as well as right. The libertarian view that sees personhood as a kind of universal premise from which society is derived by an invisible hand assumes that we possess full and capable autonomy from the outset, that we are, in Rousseau's words, born free. If, however, personhood is a form of becoming, and develops through the relation with others, then it can be stunted, distorted, turned against itself by the circumstances of its growth. Parents know this, and children feel it. Yet it is often misunderstood, and not only by libertarians. Democracy supposes that we are all developed persons, bound in networks of mutual trust and accountability. But maybe this is no longer so. Our society is in the grip of forces that influence what we become, and which discourage the gentility praised by Schiller. Many of the most fundamental relations through which we encounter other people are now veiled by narcissism. We shield ourselves, retreat behind soft barriers of false sentiment so as to cushion the impact of others' demand on us and to secure our retreat. And this is especially so in the matter of sex, and I shall venture some remarks about this topic since it shows why persons cannot be prized from their context in the libertarian way and still retain their nature as beings in relation with 
their kind. Now, it's important that the Kantian conception of the person, which has become so important for us, um, is of a being abstracted from any kind of sexual identity. Human beings divide between the male and the female. Uh, persons do not. And this has become absolutely fundamental to our legal systems and is or ought to be a premise of the legitimate forms of feminism. But uh, uh, unfortunately has been displaced. So, uh, how does the concept of the person, as it were, engage or, or, um, with this uh, incredibly difficult feature of the human condition? In the past, children were prepared for the impact of sex through the inculcation of what were then seen as virtues, uh, modesty, chastity, shame, um, subject of an excellent essay by Max Scheler. Religion played an important part in this éducation sentimentale, and it was the parson rather than the school teacher who was the leading authority. This was one important illustration of a general truth, which is that religious obedience exists in part because of its function in personal development. Religious education is, of course, directed towards a right relation with God, but that means a right relation with other people, and therefore the growing exercise of responsibility towards both self and other. The fully formed person is one whose promises are worth what he asks for them, and whose commitments endure. And this is part of what godliness consists in. The priest or parson has lost this role, which has been ceded to the classroom teacher, construed usually as a servant of the state. Modern sex education therefore assumes that attitudes like shame and guilt are unhealthy, costs that cannot be outweighed by the benefits of the enduring passions that they favour. Hence we should strive to free ourselves from these hangovers and learn to engage in sexual activity in full awareness that it is in essence no more guilty than eating or drinking, a psychological benefit that need have no psychological cost. Much modern sex education is therefore designed as a therapy for guilt and shame, a way of getting young people to accept their sexual urges and to find ways to express them without feeling bad about it. What makes people feel bad, it is suggested, is the judgmental attitude prevalent in the surrounding culture. Where you'd find it now, I don't know. But, but people, young people are supposed to interiorise this judgmental attitude so that they accuse themselves in the very moment of sexual release. Moral progress means freeing ourselves from this internal judgment, learning to express our sexuality freely and to overcome the irrational guilt that stems from others and not from our true inner selves. And we can see in that belief another version of the born free fallacy that we find in Rousseau. The, the, uh, the priest might have uh, agreed that we must aim to find ways to express our sexual desires without feeling guilt and shame, but he would have added that guilt and shame are often justified and that what they demand of us is not therapy in order to remove them, but right, right conduct in order that they should not occur. And that raises the question of what right conduct might be and how it could be taught to the young. And this, I think, is where a deeper understanding of context is required. And the context is that of childhood and adolescence, in which we slowly shape ourselves as persons by interacting with those who truly care for us so as to acquire the virtues needed for our own flourishing. According to Aristotle, whose works precede the full evolution of the person idea, but who has been on just about everybody's tongue today, this process of moral development depends on example and imitation, whereby we rescue our states of mind from animal appetite and incorporate them into the life of reason. What was an instinctive reaction then becomes a responsible choice. Consider courage, an example that was of considerable importance for Aristotle. Courage is a virtue that enables us to surmount the animal instincts of fear and rage in order to do what is right and honourable in the midst of danger. Courage should not be confused with the instinctive aggression of the cornered animal. The soldier who rushes to share the danger of his comrades is not just obeying an instinct. He has risen above that instinct and judged it to be right to act on it. He has a motive and not just an urge to join the battle, and that motive is honour and duty towards his fellows and shame at letting them down. Such a motive can prevail over fear and dread only because the soldier also has the virtue that enables him to act on it. And in acting from this motive of honour, the soldier is acting for others 
and from a conception of how he looks in others' eyes. In short, he acts from a full, free, personal involvement in his predicament, conscious that he is judged for what he does and aiming at a good which he understands in personal terms. The function of the virtues is precisely to replace the animal with the person as the centre of our activity, to ensure that what we do stems from our own accountability and self-conception and cements the relations of dependency and commitment on which our lives depend. Now, I think that exactly similar things should be said of sexual desire, and this is something to which I once uh, devoted uh, a, a book. This is root, uh, desire, as I argue, is rooted in instincts that we share with the other animals. And when one person pursues another, this may at times not look so very different from the encounter of horse and mare in a field. However, just as in the case of the soldier, the person who responds to this instinct also stands in judgment upon it. Is it right or wrong to respond? And when he responds, it is from a judgment that this is the right person, that in doing this thing, he is, in her eyes, not demeaning himself, but gaining acceptance, just as she is in his. There is a reciprocity involved, a gradual accommodation, in which consent is, as it were, woven into the very fabric of the desire, so that when they finally give way to it, the desire has become an expression of something other than instinct. Now, there, all that is familiar uh, to you, if, if not from your own life, at least from reading books, um, <laughs> Jane Austen being the best of them. There is a, a remarkable feature of the I-U encounter that should be noticed at this point. By our use of the word I, we create a new centre of being. We set the body aside, as it were, replace the organism with the self and present to others a target of their interest that is reserved and which must be made, so to speak, to sally forth in order to treat with those who address it. Others enter into dialogue with this thing called I and see it as standing in its sovereign arena, both part of the physical world and also situated on its very edge. Of course, it is not a thing in any substantial sense, and readers of Wittgenstein and Hacker will be all too familiar with the misleading shadows that are cast here by our grammar. Nevertheless, it is true to say that in a person, desire is re-centred, self-attributed self -attributed to the I, so as to become part of the interpersonal dialogue. It is trans transmuted into another state of mind altogether to become an interpersonal emotion in which subject and ob object confront each other I to you. In describing sexual desire, we're describing John's desire for Mary or Jane's desire for Bill. And the people themselves will not merely describe their desires, but also experience them in that way, as my desire for you. I want you is not a figure of speech, but the true expression of what I feel. And here the pronouns identify that very centre of free and responsible choice, which constitutes the interpersonal reality of each of us. I want you as the free being that you are, and your freedom is wrapped up in the thing I want, the thing that you identify in the first person when you engage with me, eye to eye. In popular culture, love songs are therefore elaborations of the second person pronoun. All the things you are, I've got to you under my skin, and so on. <coughs> Sex, so conceived, involves treating the other as a free subject and enjoying the mutual arousal that is possible only through the reciprocal interest in each other as self-conscious and free. The other may refuse to cooperate, may turn away in disgust, may act in ways that elicit shame and humiliation. That is why you have to be ready for it, and one reason why it is such an injustice to inflict sexual relations on children. In the face of this fact, people are tempted to retreat from the direct forms of sexual desire and take refuge in fantasy objects, objects that cannot damage or threaten you, which cannot withhold consent since they cannot give it, which are without the capacity to embarrass or shame the one who makes use of them. Hence the fashion for defending porn on individualist grounds as a release of suppressed forces, as a way of having sex without the potential conflicts that come from real encounters. Now I've dwelt on the issue of sex because to my mind it illustrates the threat present presented by modern habit habits to the proper growth of personality. We are entering a condition in which the emergence of the fully-fledged person, bound to a community in which love and commitment are the norm, 
is no longer guaranteed. We are witnessing the emergence of an atomized world of short-term desires and appetites in which people are only nominally accountable to each other. Hence the depersonalization that we witness in our contemporary attitudes to sex, we also witness elsewhere in the culture. The suggestive passage from Schiller ought to remind us of what dancing has since become. For the most part, young people now dance at the other, but not with people. <coughs> Look at popular entertainment in its current forms, and you will find a kind of at atrophy of the person, celebrated and iconized in film, music, and advertisement. The human form is stripped of its personal and sociable attributes, and presented as a raw, youthful, and essentially unfinished product. This is not a biological phenomenon, but a cultural phenomenon, a loss of the carefully nurtured sense inherited from the long attempt at civilization, that what we essentially are is also what we become through our social endorsement. Personhood is not an all-or-nothing attribute that is granted absolutely, as the libertarians assume, nor is it granted to us as members of the herd, the pack, or the hunter-gatherer clan. Personhood is a process. It can flourish and decline, it can find fulfillment and satisfaction. And all the greatest efforts of the human community in art, politics, and religion are devoted to enhancing it. So if we understand things are right, therefore, we will be disposed to reject the assumption, so widespread in moral and political debates today, that the world can be created anew, that we enjoy unlimited freedom to remake our institutions, customs, and natural circumstances and that we can do so and still enjoy the fruits of personality. We are persons by nature, to be sure, but that nature is also a dunamis, a, a potential for growth, for flourishing and fulfilment. To develop fully, we need the virtues that transfer our motives from the animal to the personal centre of our being, the virtues that put us in charge of our passions. These virtues are not available outside a tightly woven social context. Without socially endorsed forms of education, without families and spheres of mutual love, without the disciplined approach to eros and the mutuality of courtship, our social emotions are not fully re-centred in the I. Human beings find their fulfilment in mutual love and self-giving, but they get to this point by a long path of self-development, in which imitation and self-control are necessary moments. This is not a hard point to understand, once we see the development of personality in the terms suggested by Aristotle. But it is a hard thing to practice. Nevertheless, when we understand things rightly, we can begin to turn back, to pick up the process where it was left off before the individualists and the collectivists tried to re replace the tried and proven forms of moral education with their nostrums for the future of mankind. Uh, when you're lucky, see you in 30, 35 minutes.